Hi there. My name is Agatha Romanyuk and I'm a writer and a reporter. And before I begin my talk today, I want to say that this is a very special day for me. On a beautiful day like this, 11 years ago, my son was born. And you might be thinking, why is this lady telling us about this? It's not interesting. Well, yes, if not for the fact that he was not born in 2009, but he was born in 1430, according to the Arabic calendar. And he was not born in Poland, but he was born in Oman, which is the only country that's name starts with an O. And um, I'm not alone here today. I'm here with my cat, Laura, who was the ever first cat. Hi there, good morning. Who was the first cat ever to, a foreign cat ever to enter Oman 11 years ago. So this is how my journey to Oman started. And it ended with a book that um, I wrote and published a year ago about the love and life and marriage and um, female life in Oman, in this country that you, I, it's probably a safe bet, you don't know much about. Most people don't. And um, it's in a way a good thing because if you ask Omani officials and just regular Omanis, they want their country to be the Canada of the Middle East. What does that mean? It means that Oman hardly ever hits the news or the headlines with things like another corruption scandal or another terrorist attack or another economic crisis or anything like that. They keep it quiet, they keep it to themselves, and they are a very happy nation. Now, where is Oman? Oman is in the Middle East at the very tip, at the very end of the Arabian Peninsula, um, neighboring, neighboring the United Emirates and Yemen. And it's a relatively small country with a population of 4 million people with a, a beautiful setting in terms of um, the landscape. So it has deserts and it has mountains and it has this beautiful um, seaside that's practically empty so you can walk for miles and nobody will bother you. And um, it's really a very interesting country in terms of its culture and the way it developed. Now, as you probably have never heard too much about Oman, well, neither had I, the, you know, the moment I walked um, onto the board of the plane and then um, I arrived in Oman these 11 years ago, um, because it's a country that underwent a very special change. Back in the 1970s, which is, for many of you, this is ancient history, some of us were almost alive at the time, it was a country very poor and very undeveloped. Pretty much um, a country where just nomadic tribes moved around the country and um, did not build anything, did not have schools or hospitals or anything like that. And um, all they did was a little bit of fishery and a little bit of um, gardening, really not agriculture because there are hardly any fruitful soils in Oman. Now, a miracle happened as a miracle in general happened in that part of the world. So oil was discovered and uh, that boom changed everything. But um, another thing happened as well. A young man at the age of 30 who became known later as the greatest sultan of all time, Qaboos bin Said Qaboos, um, sat upon the throne, overthrowing his, hus uh, his father. Uh, and he sat on that throne and ruled Oman for almost 50 years, which is like, it's probably, it's not the world record. That belongs to the, um, to the queen Elizabeth II, long live the queen. But anyway, so he, uh, he died last year and the time of his rule is already called the uh, Renaissance of Oman because his country was, as I said, underdeveloped and poor, which means that these not even 50 years ago, there were hardly any roads. It was like a uh, hundred kilometers of dirt, dirt roads. There were no schools, no hospitals. So, you know, infrastructure was poor and the um, infant morality, mortality was skyrocketing and people just, you know, the expectancy of life was very short. And now flash forward to 2020, and this is uh, um, a heaven and earth with uh, I wish we had infrastructure at Latin Poland, I mean, in terms of like highways and roads and everything. And yet, it's a country of greatest contrasts. So you have these 
you know, six lane highways on one hand and you have air, conditions, air conditioned uh, mm, bus stops. And on the other hand, what you have things like black magic and witchery on daily basis and you can pay by card for their services. Well, on one hand you have Tinder and people, you know, matching online. And on the other hand, you have traditional uh, matchmakers that uh, walk the streets marching against Tinder. So you have all these cultural clashes because it's so much easier to build things in terms of buildings and institutions and highways and things um, than change social norms. So that's a country of two pieces. Now, in one way, it's going really, really fast, faster than many European countries. In another way, it has a slow pace of very slow culture change. And this is something I want to talk to you about today. And this is something I wrote my book about. And that is precisely how does love and relations fit into all this? Now, I had this very strange conversation when we first arrived. Remember, Laura, you were with me on that day um, with a neighbor. And she asked me, you know, which is a typical question when you first arrive in Oman and you're a female, they ask you like, well, are you married? Obviously you are, because pretty much everyone over the age of 25 is married. Um, I'm speaking for females. And now the next question they always ask you like is, um, are you the only wife of your husband's? Because they know that in Europe, we're not allowed to have more than one spouse. And my answer to this was always, Yes, uh, and I was very proud to say that our marriage was a love marriage and I was the one and only wife of my husband's. And the answer to this uh, from the Omani side was always the same, oh, I am so sorry. Now, it kind of blew my mind. Like, what, what do you mean? This is a love marriage and I'm the only wife and you're sorry about that? And they were sorry for many reasons. And that stream sort of changed my perspective. This is something I wanted to talk to you about. Now, for them, being the only wife means that you have all the responsibilities, both in the relationship and in the household. So it means that you have to attend all the functions. And now, mind you that in Oman, families are large. So there are many, many family functions that you have to go there to and um, accompany your, your husband. So if you're the only wife, you have to go all the weddings and all the funerals and all the, all the parties and the aunties and the gatherings and everything like that. So that's one. We have to bear all the children and take care of them. And now with fertility rate as it is now of like average of four, average mind you, that means that you have to bear all of these children and you have to take care of them. So it's all on you. Now, all the household duties, that's in you, all the washing and the cooking and everything else. Now, if, like it is in Oman, your husband has two or three wives, well, you share this, right? You share the children, you share the responsibilities, and everything else. So that's one point. And another point from their perspective is that if you're the only wife, you are ever so lonely. Well, when your husband is out, you sit at home by yourself, you have no one to talk to, no one to complain to, no, one, no one's shoulder to cry on, and so forth. So that, that's the second thing. You're lonely and you're on your own. So you cannot side with anyone if you quarrel with your husband. You're just alone. And another thing is, and that's the third point, is that if your, love, if your marriage is a love marriage and you're the only wife, nothing protects you. When love ends, everything ends and you're on your own. Now, while in Oman, if you have a contract and then people do, because if you're the second or the third wife, or even the first wife, you wanna protect yourself. So you have a contract and that contract protects your rights. It tells you and tells your partner what happens if you split, what happens if um, you bear a child or if he takes another wife and it's all drafted in details. Now. What do we have in Poland to protect us? The law? Do you know that one fourth of all prisoners in Poland are the alimony avoiders? So if you're married and you split or your husband walks on you, walks out on you and leaves you with your children, then good luck chasing him for alimony. In Oman, it doesn't happen because you have the contract. Now, 
So they couldn't really understand why our concept of love marriage is so much more uh, protective or better or superior to theirs. They just, they were like, I mean, really? And then, well, to have a love marriage, it also means that you have to find love, you have to seek love, you have to go through all the uh, disappointments and all the emotions and everything else. Well, if you have a contract marriage now, you're presented with candidates, mostly from your distant family, distant family or friends or neighbors or something. And you know all about them because no facts are ever um, hidden, they're all revealed. And, um, and that you make an informed and rational choice. Now, this blows my mind and it still, it blew my mind back then, it still blows my mind. Um, and being raised and born in a European country and in our culture, I would probably still not opt out for a contract marriage. But it was very interesting and very inspiring to learn a different perspective. And it takes uh, time in another person from a different culture to talk to you through the details to make you understand that our worldview is not the only possible worldview and that our model of, in that case, marriage is not the only one that works. So we did learn a lot, Laura, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Um, she loved it back there in Oman. It was hot and there were many lizards to hunt and we were very happy there. And I hope that one day you will go and travel to Oman and you'll learn a lot more about this country than just the fact that it's name starts with O and that you can have a husband uh, or a wife by contract. Thank you.